then your model isn't, uh, is it a big bang model with an initial emergence out of nothing and then eventually a collapse back to that? No. No. So, no. okay, so how do you conceptualize that? Well, first of all, it is a big bang model. In other words, there is a big bang, but the big bang was not the beginning. The model, the reason people have trouble with this model, I think, is you're probably going to have trouble with it, and you're not unique in this. Um, you see, people tend to think that if you have a model in which it keeps on going in some sense, and your Big Bang is not the beginning, that you've got to collapse back. So it expands, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, then it comes back, mm -hmm. and then you're back with... But this it seems model simpler is, that way. Yes, but this model is not like that. And that's where you've got to get your mind around it. Okay. And it's... People have trouble, and I agree with it. It's, it is a crazy idea, and I admit it's a crazy idea. The trouble is it seems it's quite likely it's true from certain okay. observational okay. things. But it's crazy, too. It can be crazy and true at the same time. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's like a definition of life. <laughs> yes, but you see, in this model, the universe expands, and it expands, and this exponential expansion we seem to see, the stars seem to be... Going, starting to go away from us, these very distant stars that people look at, with an increasing speed. Right, and right. It seems to be this exponential expansion. Mm -hmm. and That's I what's driven the dark energy hypothesis. I That's presume. what they call it's really. Well, I, I claim it is absolutely nothing inconsistent with Einstein's nineteen seventeen. Was it in modification? If you see, that he regarded his biggest mistake, but he's probably actually right. Mm -hmm. That's to say, the introduction of a cosmological constant. constant. Right, right. Yeah. He introduced it for the wrong reason. That's true. But he was right to introduce it, even though he regarded his, <laughs> his biggest mistake. Right. Well, irony he needed there. it to make things work, but he didn't have any real practical reason for assuming that it was true, apart from... He wanted a static universe. He didn't like the expansion. No, the, he, he mm -hmm. didn't, no this was at a time before... I think Hubble had already seen the expansion, but it hadn't mm -hmm. quite got through to Einstein how convincing these results were. So he wanted a universe which was just static and stayed there forever. Right, right. And then he needed the cosmological constant to do that. That's correct. He would need that. However, he was wrong. To th when he got convinced, oh, no, the universe is expanding. Sorry. He, mm -hmm. said, he said, oh, well, that was a mistake. My biggest blunder, he said. The trouble is, his biggest blunder turned out to be true. Apparently. I mean, this is an argument. People don't necessarily think it was. People might not think it's the cosmological constant. I think it was. I think it's right. I have reason, you know, internal reasons for that. But let's say um, that this is right. It's a cosmological constant. The universe expands and expands exponential expansion. Now, you might ask, who's in this universe, eventually? Not us. The black holes will all have evaporated away by... Hawking evaporation, they've swallowed galactic clusters. What's left in the universe? Pretty well photons. Now I'm giving you the simplified version okay. of the theory because okay. you, because there's some questions about it still. But let's say it's dominated by photons, which is pretty pretty well true, but not let's take that. Okay. Now the trouble with photons is that they don't feel the passage of time. Right. And more importantly, the equations governing light are the wonderful equations due to James Clerk Maxwell, the Maxwell equations. And the Maxwell equations have a very interesting property, that they can't tell big from small. They're what's called conformally invariant. That if you have a system in which you've got some electromagnetic field, and you could stretch this system to bigger or smaller, it doesn't notice the difference. The equations right. work just as well. And you can squash them here and stretch them here. Well, in, is that in part because space really doesn't mean anything to a photon? In a sense. Well, it's the scale of space. You see, it's what we call... There's a term which I'll use here. It's called conformal. Conformal means big and small. I very much like... You, we talked about Escher a minute ago. There are these Escher pictures called circle limits, where he describes what's called hyperbolic geometry, but don't worry about that. The most famous one is these angels and devils. And you see right. them, there's a circular boundary. And they look as though they get smaller and smaller and smaller as they get to the edge. Yes. Now, as far as those angels and devils are concerned, the little ones are just the same as the big ones. 
Right. They don't know that they're small at the, towards the edge. And that, to them, is an infinite universe. But to us, we can see, no, there's this infinity which is just sitting there. And these angels and devils, if they don't know big from small, I'm not sure I have a bit of trouble using this to explain things because they, the angels and devils do have a size in the picture. But you see, if they were made of massless material, that wouldn't know big from small. So if they were made of just electromagnetism, then big and small are equivalent. And so you wouldn't know when you got to the edge of this universe. So that infinity is just like anywhere else. That's the difficult concept in this thing. That the photons reach infinity without realizing, without realizing anything funny has happened, if you put it like that. Infinity in this conformal picture is just like anywhere else. It's only mass that knows the difference. If you want to build a clock, you need mass. And the, the, this comes from the, the two most famous equations of 20th century physics. And the two most famous equations, one of them is Einstein's E equals mc squared, of course, which tells us that energy and mass are equivalent. And the earlier one was, ne it was um, Max Planck's E equals h nu, or E equals hf, whatever else you call the frequency, which tells you that energy and frequency are equivalent. Put the two together, that tells you mass and frequency are equivalent. So that means that if you have a mass, it is a clock. It has a frequency simply determined by its mass. And this fact is really the basis of modern clocks, which are extraordinarily precise. They don't directly give this because the frequency is much too high. You have to scale it down. But roughly it's the same idea. So a clock, a mass is a clock. But the other side of that coin is if you don't have any mass, you don't have any clocks. So you don't have any time? You don't have any time scale. You mm -hmm. don't have any distance measure. So if the world is inhabited only by massless things, say photons, then it doesn't know big from small. It doesn't know hot from cold. And so the idea is, and this is where you have to take a deep breath. <laughs> the yeah, idea as is, opposed to all the other parts of this conversation. <laughs> yes. The idea is that the remote future is indistinguishable from a Big Bang, so long as there is no mass around. Now, in the remote future, the reason you have no mass around is basically, well, you, listen, there's a complicated part of the argument. Yeah. But let's say it's because there's mainly photons. That's good enough. What about the other end? What about the Big Bang? Well, there's yeah. lots of mass there, surely. But the thing is that at the Big Bang, things get so hot, things are moving around so fast, if you like, that the energy, or the mass energy, mass hyphen energy, the concept of mass, according to Einstein, is almost entirely in their motion. And that the mass becomes more and more irrelevant the closer you get to the Big Bang. So again, you have a situation where mass is effectively zero. And so it, are, are, you, are you, is it your claim, belief, theory, that when things ground out in a universe that only consists of electromagnetic radiation, that that is now a precondition for an event like the Big Bang? In a sense, yes. I'm saying that the physics which is going on at the very remote future is extraordinarily like the physics going on at the very beginning. I'm, I'm going to end of the, there. When I say beginning, I only mean the Big Bang, because it's not really the beginning. Yes, <laughs> yes. 